Welcome everyone to the Middle Game Masterclass. My name is International Master William Pascal. I started playing chess in 1985. I've been playing chess for over 30 years and I've been teaching chess for over 20 years now, both to private individuals, in the schools, players of all different levels from beginners up through masters. I have extensive tournament experience and now it's my pleasure to share with you this middle game course. I've set it up so that we have 10 hours of instruction divided into 20 parts. In this essential middle game course, we are going to go through the games of world champions, Botvinnik, Aliakin, Capablanca, world class players like Korchnoi, Salo Flor. Even older masters like Rubinstein, Nimzovich, Steinitz. I believe these classic masters played so many formative games. It's exciting to study the modern games of 2017, but really the classic masters games gives us so much information about the fundamentals of chess. Why is the middle game really important? In the end game and the opening, memorization plays a critical role. Even relatively weak players can be trained to memorize variations, especially in the opening. And in the end game, there exist end game table bases, positions that have been isolated and programmed into computers. Analysis has exhaustively cataloged these positions. So even in the end game, it's possible to memorize certain concepts. But in the middle game, you really have to have a concrete understanding of the fundamental principles. Every middle game is a little bit different. The middle game is fundamentally complex. Most of the pieces are on the board and you're on your own. In this course, we're going to start with kind of static concepts and work our way forward to more dynamic ones. In the first several chapters, we'll start with pawn structure, isolated queen pawn, hanging pawns, queenside minority attack, the importance of central pawn preponderance, weak squares, outposts, working our way through strategic concepts laid out by Nimzovich in part seven, focusing on closed positions, then pawn breaks, and in the middle we're gonna talk about coordination of pieces and pawns. We learn about bad pieces, different kinds of bad pieces, knights versus bishops, and now we start moving toward dynamic concepts coordination of the pieces, space advantage, dynamic considerations like when to exchange, when to exchange the queens and transpose to the end game. And then of course, very important concepts like the open position, king safety, and the bishop pair, which becomes so powerful in the open positions. So moving forward from more static concepts to the more dynamic concepts at the end of the class. Many players think that the isolated queen pawn is always a clear static weakness. This is not the case. There are two sides to positions with the isolated queen pawn. And by saying that, I mean that there are situations where the isolated queen pawn can be advantageous. We're going to take a look at some games by former world champion Mikhail Botvinnik, who often played with the isolated queen pawn, both with white and black. He would play on the white side of the queen's gambit, also on the black side of the French defense sometimes. And Botvinnik is a perfect example of a great player who used the isolated queen pawn positions to generate attacking chances. The isolated queen pawn can control support points in the center. We play d4. Most commonly, the support points in the squares e5 and c5 seen later on in isolated queen pawn positions. We'll take a look at that as we progress here. So there are two sides to the isolated queen pawn. Basically, it can be a pawn that helps to generate central control, attacking chances. It can also be a static weakness when there are less pieces on the board. So the general rule with the isolated queen pawn is that the side with the isolated queen pawn should try to avoid exchanging pieces. And the side playing against the isolated queen pawn should be trying to trade pieces to reach an endgame or more simplified position 
where the pawn really becomes a static weakness. Our first example game is from Leningrad 1930. This is Mikhail Botvinnik versus Batuyev. So we have d4, d5, and we go into a queen's gamut decline. This is probably the most common way to reach an isolated queen pawn. Any sort of queen's gambit, queen's gambit accepted, tarash. Here black could play c5. But here we have the queen's gambit decline, Botvinnik versus Batuyev. And this is a orthodox queen's gambit, very, very typical variation. We're going to use this as a kind of base to examine this structure. So anyway, here we have knight f3, knight bd7, the orthodox queen's gambit. But Vinnick played bishop to d3 in this game. And this is not such a common move by today's standards. Rook c1 and queen c2 being much more common. Now black plays d takes c4, bishop takes c4, and c5. This is a reasonable way for black to counterattack the center. And after castles, c takes d4, e takes d4, we end up with the classic isolated queen pawn. It's kind of like a standard position where we can start to examine the features of this type of structure. The support points the pawn provides are very important. So we have the e5 square and we have the c5 square. Those are potential outposts for our pieces. By having this isolated queen pawn in the center on d4, we have a worse structure with white, but we have a pawn that controls key central squares. It's almost like having an extra piece in the center of the board in the middle game stage. And Budvinnik uses this very effectively in this game and many others. We'll take a look here. I just wanted to show you what would happen if we didn't take back with the pawn, if we took back with the knight, how ineffective this really is, knight takes d4. If we take back with the knight, we don't accept the isolated queen pawn, which many amateurs are apt to do. The symmetrical structure leaves us with a very insipid position where white doesn't have realistic chances to gain an advantage. There just isn't any real dynamism, no imbalance in the position. So it's key to take with the pawn here, go into the isolated queen pawn position. Now black starts to blockade the isolated queen pawn. We'll actually cover blockade in a specific chapter in the middle game course. Bishop to b3, and now knight on bd5. This is not the only move. We'll see a different move in another game here. Knight bd5, and now Budvinnik played knight e5. Support point, this is very important that d pawn making it possible for us to play actively with a forward position piece on e5. Black should be trying to trade pieces, but he does so here by playing very passively in this example. Probably the best would be to develop the pieces somehow. I don't even think that knight d5 was necessarily the best move. We'll see another example in a minute. Here Batuyev actually undeveloped with knight to d7, kind of a negative move, in order to exchange pieces. His concept is right. When you're playing against the isolated queen pawn, it is a good idea to trade pieces. If you simplify into an end game with an isolated queen pawn, you may get an advantage. You may be able to play against that pawn and eventually win it. But it's a very utopian kind of situation where you can actually win the isolated queen pawn. It's not that common. Here Batuyev undevelops, knight d7. We have bishop takes e7. And now he could take with the queen, but it loses material. So he takes back with the knight and ends up in a kind of passive position. Queen e2, knight f6. White's connected his rooks. He's better developed. Rook on f to d1, b6. I know a lot of students that I worked with would probably be fearful to play white's position, thinking that they just have an isolated pawn. They must be worse. But white's pieces are more harmonious. White is fully developed after rook c1, bishop to b7, and now f3, a move which actually inhibits the strength of the bishop on b7, as well as creating a possible outpost for white's knight at e4. Rook c8, and then out of the blue, the active pieces allow a winning combination for white here. Knight takes f7, 
if king takes f7, he is just in a lot of trouble with a very, very misplaced king, losing two pawns and a rook for the pieces, plus an endangered king. I think it's probably lost. Plays instead rook takes, and now queen takes e6, queen f8, and Budvenik has a very strong attack here. He's guaranteed to get enough material, in this case two pawns and a rook for two pieces, but his attack is lingering and very strong. Knight e4. Take a look at this isolated queen pawn in this position as well. It is a passed pawn at this point. This could actually, in an endgame scenario, become a very, very effective factor in this game. In any case, white is winning by direct threats anyway. Rook takes c1, rook takes c1. He tries to blockade the d5 square. Good idea. But knight d6, white is winning material. Bishop a8, and rook e1 piling up on the pin the knight on e7. Very amazing attacking game by white. Black is hopeless here. g6, knight takes f7, queen takes f7, and the very beautiful Queen takes e7, exploiting the diagonal of this bishop on b3. So here we see the attacking potential generated by the open lines and the central control as a result of the isolated queen pawn on d4.